No niin, huomenta, huomenta kaikille. Lämpimästi tervetuloa tähän suuntaseminaariin. Mun nimi on Kirsi Konola, Keitsomaisten palvelusäätiöstä. Tää, mm, kuullaan enemmän tuossa kohta siitä, mikä, mikä suunta on, on mutta, mutta tänään keskustellaan henkilökohtaisesta budjetoinnista, valinnanvapaudesta, itsemääräämisoikeudesta, mitä se, mitä se Suomessa, Suomessa tarkoittaa ja mitä se maailmalla, maailmalla tarkoittaa tällä hetkellä. Aloitetaan, aloitetaan Sirpa Pietikäisen tervehdyksellä. Sirpa on, on ö, tehnyt paljon työtä vammaisten ihmisten oikeuksien puolesta Euro, Euroopan parlamentissa. Meillä oli äsken just ei myytävänä kampanjan ö, tiedotustilaisuus, katsaus siihen, missä nyt mennään ö, kilpailutuksen lopettamisessa. Ja, ja Sirpa toi sinne, sinne vahvan viestin. viestin viestin myös siitä, siitä että tosiaan kilpa, kilpailutuksia ei, ei tarvita. Mutta tervetuloa Sirpa avaamaan, avaamaan tämä tilaisuus. Hyvät kuulijat, oikein hyvää suunta tilaisuutta ja seminaaria teillä ja toivottavasti tämä poikii myös hyvin paljon jatkoon keskusteluja. Mun mielestä tässä suuntahankkeessa ja keskustelussa me ollaan nyt ihan sen olennaisen ytimen äärellä. Eli kysehän on ihmisten perusoikeuksista. Siitä, että ihmistä ei saa perusteetta asettaa eriarvoiseen asemaan, vaan hänellä pitää olla samat oikeudet lähtökohtaisesti. Ja yhteiskunnan tehtävä on silloin tämä trampoliinitehtävä. Eli esimerkiksi saavutettavuuden, josta on tämä saavutettavuusdirektiivi tulossa, sosiaalisten palveluiden ja toimeentulojen muun kautta edes auttaa, että se mahdollisimman tasa-arvoinen elämä ja samat oikeudet sitten voisi vois toteutua. Eli syrjintä ei ole pelkästään sitä, että aktiivisesti käy jonkun ihmisryhmän kimppuun tai estää heitä toteuttavasta jotain vapauksiaan, vaan se on myös passiivista sellaista. Jos viedään ne oikeudet, joilla voisi vapautta todi, toteuttaa, niin silloin tosiasiallisesti rajo, rajoitetaan vapautta ja tosiasiallisesti esimerkiksi pahimmissa tapauksissa oikeasti aiheutetaan samanlaisia liikuntarajoitteita vaikkapa, vaikkapa sitten kun, kun ihan fyysisellä sitomisella. No. Jotta perusoikeudet voi toteutua, pitää olla palveluita ja pitää olla toimeentuloa. Jotta ne palvelut ja toimeentulo toimivat, niin ihmisen, joka tarvitsee niitä, pitää olla itse, itse niitä määrittelemässä. Eihän meillekään kukaan määrittele ulkoa sitä, missä kaupassa tai pitäisikö ikkunat siivota vai olisiko minulle tärkeämpi lähteä lenkille vai, vai tarvitsisinko tukea esimerkiksi jonkun asian opiskeluun tai työntekemiseen tai johonkin muuhun. Ja hiljaista syrjintää on myöskin se, että me ylhäältä kategorian mukaan määrittelemme ihmisille, mihin heidän tulee käyttää rahansa tai minkälaisia palveluita he tarvitsevat. Muistisairas, dementikko, vammainen, näkövammainen, kehitysvammainen, kuulovammainen, näkövamma, näkövamma tai niin edelleen. Tarvitsisiko sitä vai tätä? Ja sitten tehdään vielä näitä objektiivisia mittareita, että sujuuko se ja tämä ja tuo, ja tarvitseeko sitten esimerkiksi henkilökohtaista avustajaa tai, tai kyytiä, tai onko oikeus sellaiseen tai tällaiseen asumiseen. Ja me ei myöskään niin nähdä eikä tunnisteta, että se on syrjintää. Siihen ei ole perustetta. No. Silloin kun meillä pitäisi olla tämä saavutettavuus ja käyttäjälähtöinen suunnittelu ja myöskin sit siellä palvelujen ja toimeentulon puolella, niin mitä se sitten tarkoittaa? Se tarkoittaa henkilökohtaista budjetointia. Sitä, että me kysymme ihmiseltä itseltä, mikä auttaa häntä parhaiten kehittymään, pärjäämään, ratkaisemaan omia ongelmia, lisäämään jotakin omaa hyvinvointia tai jotain muuta ratkaisua. Täällä puhutaan myöskin silloin ö, ö, tänään tämmöistä välittäjätoiminnosta, eli siitä, että kuka on, mä käytän semmoista sanaa kuin edunvalvoja, vaikka Suomessa sille ei ole kaunis klangi, mutta kuka on se auttaja? Jos mulla esimerkiksi ei ole välttämättä kykyjä itselläni tai, tai aikaa tai voimavaroja selvittää erilaisia mahdollisia palveluita tai vertailla niitä keskenään tai tota, edes perehtyy kaikki mun omiin tarpeisiini. Niin kuka auttaa mua siinä? 
Ja silloin meillä olisi hirveän olennaista luoda näitä henkilökohtaisia tukipalveluita, jotka on riippumattomia. Eli että se ei ole pelkkä se kunnan virallinen tai virallinen neuvoja esimerkiksi tai, tai sen oman asumisyksikön ihminen, vaan se on se, joka auttaa sinua selvittämään, pohtimaan, tekemään omia valintoja, vertailemaan esimerkiksi erilaisia, erilaisia vaihtoehtoja tai tarjottujen palvelujen sisältöä. No mistähän tällainen voisi löytyä? Se voi tietysti löytyä monesta eri järjestösektorista, vapaaehtoistoiminnasta tai tuttava piiristä tai, tai, tai tuota vähän kauemmasta perheestä. Ihan läheinen perhe ei tässä käy siksi, että siinä voi olla vähän tämmöistä intressiristiriita. Mutta järjestöt. Meillä on keksitty tämä juttu jo kulkaa Suomessa. Ja mun mielestä tämä on semmoinen kultajyvä, jota me ei aina nähdä. Jos meidän pitää olla... Tämä puolesta puhuja. Ja jos meillä pitää olla esimerkiksi palvelujen käyttäjälähtöinen suunnittelu. No mitä järjestöt on tehnyt, esimerkiksi kehitysvammajärjestöt tai vammaisjärjestöt tai potilasjärjestöt, halkihistoria. Vienyt eteenpäin sen oman käyttäjäryhmän tarpeita ja toiveita ja kehittänyt sen mukaisia palveluja. Ja sen takia mä toivon, että jatkossa esimerkiksi tästä henkilökohtaisesta budjetista voisi poikkea Suomen lainsäädäntöön sellainen ajattelu, että näillä järjestöillä voisi olla edunvalvontaoikeus, tämmöinen spokesperson, joka tarkoittaa sitä, että siellä voi olla se kontaktihenkilö, joka voi auttaa valitsemaan erilaisten palvelujen tai budjetointivaihtoehtojen välillä. Tai silloin, jos se palvelu ei pelaakaan niin kuin pitäisi tai tai niitä toiveita ei kuulla, niin se voisi olla se puolesta puhuja, joka tulee mukaan sitten käymään joskus jopa hiukan taisteluakin, mutta ainakin rakentavaa keskustelua niiden viranomaisten tai palveluntuottajien tai muiden, muiden kanssa. Ja kyllä sitten pitkällä aikajänteellä tietysti toivon, että näillä järjestöillä sitten voisi olla myöskin tämmöinen ryhmäkanneoikeus, jos me nähdään ihan systemaattisesti jossakin palveluissa tai muussa tämmöinen, tämmöinen tota, vinouma, niin tota, silloin se tarvitsisi vähän isomman äänisen eteen korjaamiseksi. No, tässä on ehkä tätä laajempaa kehikkoa tähän henkilökohtaiseen budjetointiin. Ja sitten siitä itsessään, niin tämän perustulokokeilun ja perustuloajattelun rinnalla, niin nämä on se pari valjakko, jolla me voitaisiin todella isosti Suomessa tehdä jotain uutta ja viedä sitä sitten yhdessä vaikkapa ää, tota, muiden, ää, muiden toimijatahojen kanssa sitä eteenpäin ää, tuota, EU-ssa ja tämmöisenä eurooppalaisena ajatteluna, miten ihmiset itse voivat henkilökohtaiset tarpeensa toteuttaa siinä ää, henkilökohtaisen budjetoinnin, palvelujen, hankintojen, kehikossa ja mihin heillä olisi tämä perustuloattelu. Ainakin se perusoikeus ja sitten tarvitaan monissa esimerkiksi tämmöisissä vamma, vammaisuustilanteissa, niin tarvitaan toki aika paljon muutakin ä, oikeutta ja ä, lisää ja tukea. Ja tota, tämä on ä, asia, joka on isosti lähdössä eteenpäin ja mä myös itse tosi mielelläni kuulen, mitä suunnassa on tähän mennessä jo tehty ja mitä kokemuksia meidän ä, meidän tota, Scotti ja muilta vierailta, vierailta me voimme kuulla ja, ja tota, katsotaan sitten, miten asia, asia saadaan eteenpäin. Kiitoksia paljon ja oikein erinomaista seminaaria ja tästä eteenpäin tsemppiä myöskin näiden asioiden eteenpäin viemisessä. Kiitos Sirpa. Viisaista sanoista ollaan tosiaan uuden, uuden äärellä ja tarvitaan uudenlaisia tapoja, tapoja toimia. Tervetuloa munkin puolesta teille kaikille. Mä oon Kukkaniemen Petteri kehitysvammaisten palvelusäätiöstä ja nykyisin myös suunnasta. Työskentelen projektipäällikkönä näiden, näiden asioiden äärellä. Ehkä jo tässä kohtaa yleisöstä mä haluaisin nostaa esille Hautalan Heidin joka on työskennellyt pitkän aikaa meikäläisen kollegana, mutta tota noin, tulevaisuudessa vielä, vielä tiiviimmin sitten tämän, tämän tota parissa. Ö, muutama sana ohjelmasta. Hetken päästä tota noin, tämän suunnan lyhyen, lyhyen toiminnan esittelyn jälkeen äänen päästetään meidän pitkäaikainen kumppani Simon Duffy ja Keith Etherington, joiden johdolla jatketaan tota lounaaseen asti. Tuo lounas on tarjolla tuossa tota oven toisella puolella 
kello 12 alkaen ja koitetaan pitää se tauko noin 45 minuutin pituisena, jonka jälkeen sitten jatkavat vielä hetken tuosta tota noin aiheesta. Iltapäivällä meillä on otsikko, miltä tulevaisuus näyttää, ja siinä pureudutaan sitten henkilökohtaisen budjetoinnin kokeilemiseen. Silloin me kuullaan, että mitä valinnanvapauspiloteille kuuluu tällä hetkellä, ja sitä aihetta meillä on esittelemässä STMstä Kirsi Paasovaara, ja sitten eri alueilta päijät Tarja Rautsiala, Satakunnasta Merja Paavola ja sitten tuota Keski-Pohjanmaalta Miia Luokkanen. Ja itse mä kerron muutaman sanan sitten, että mitä, mitä Etelä-Savoon on, on tähän mennessä suunniteltu. Ja lopuksi me vedetään vähän tilaisuutta yhteen ja jatketaan sitten keskustelua tuota noin kahvilomassa niin, että päätetään tämä tilaisuus puoli neljään mennessä. Muita käytännön asioita. Napatkaa tuolta tuota, no, oven vierestä materiaalia mukaan, niin meillä on vähän vähemmän kannettavaa Tampereelle. Ennakkotiedon mukaisesti tätä tilaisuutta ei tulkata. Me luotetaan siihen, meidän kokemus on, että, että meidän ulkomaiset puhujat on sen verran selväsanaisia, että toivottavasti tuota, no, he tulee ymmärretyksi. Jos jotain menee ohi, niin tuota, tämä tilaisuus tallennetaan ja se videotallenne on sitten saatavilla tota noin, pien, pienellä viiveellä sitten suoraan meidän osallistujille ja sitten, sitten myös sivujen, sivujen kautta. Valokuvia varmasti otetaan tässä tilaisuudessa myös, että jos jostain syystä et halua tulla tota noin kuvatuksi, niin käy nykäsemässä sitten kuvaajaa, kuvaajaa tota hihasta. Mm. Ja lisäksi toki kysytään sitten jälkikäteen palautetta. Kiitos, jos, jos ja kun jätätte sitä. Me kannustetaan teitä kovasti keskustelemaan täällä tuota paikan päällä toistenne kanssa ja meidän kanssa, mutta myös sitten somessa. Ja sitä varten tuolla Dian alaidassa on sitten toitalainen tunniste, mitä, mitä voi käyttää. Ja ihan huomion arvosta, että meidän suunnan nettisivut on, on tota noin, saanut, saanut tota noin, avautunut. Eilen ja sille se osoite on toi suunta.fi. Eli lämpimästi tervetuloa teille kaikille. Yksi asia, mikä piti muistaa sanoa, Invavessa on ikävästi kai kuulemma tota näin, poissa käytöstä just tällä hetkellä ja huoltomies on tilattu ja toinen vessa löytyy jostain vähän kauempaa, niin nykäskää tuolta tota näin, tämän paikan henkilökunnan hihaa, niin he opastaa tässä asiassa. Mutta tosiaan kehitysvammaisten palvelusäätiö on työskennellyt henkilökohtaisen budjetoinnin parissa nyt jo laskeskelin, että pian yhdeksän vuoden ajan. Ja vastaten tällä niin useampaankin eri, erinäiseen pyyntöön ja toisaalta sillä niin kuin selvittääksemme niitä niin kuin omia ajatuksia ja sitä toimintaa, toimintaa tämän, tämän osalta, niin me ollaan päätetty organisoitua tämän aiheen parissa uudelleen ja, ja nimetty se tällä suuntatoiminnaksi. Eli suunta on siis henkilökohtaisen budjetoinnin keskus, jonka päämääränä on sitten lisätä ihmisten valinnan ja vaikuttamisen mahdollisuuksia oman tuen ratkaisuihin ja toteutumiseen. Meidän tavoitteena on pitää fokus kirkkaana siinä, että mistä henkilökohtaisessa budjetoinnissa on kysymys. Ja me halutaan kehittää uudenlaisia toimintatapoja ja nimetty, että, että niiden pitäisi olla tällaisia, joissa yhdistyy ihmisoikeusperusta ja resurssiviisasta toiminta. Tähän mennessä, kun me ollaan pohdittu sellaisia periaatteita, mitä, mitä tätä toimintaa ohjaa, niin, niin me ollaan nostettu esille viisi tällaista kulmaa, jotka on osallisuus, tasa-arvo, kumppanuus, yhteiskehittäminen ja kokeilemalla kehittäminen. Ja näistä tällä osallisuudella me tarkoitetaan sitä, että ihmisten oikeutta saavutettavaan tietoon ja osallistumiseen omaa elämää koskevissa päätöksissä. Tasa-arvolla me taas tarkoitetaan tässä tapauksessa kaikkien ihmisten yhdenvertaista kohtelua ja arvoa yksilöinä kuin, kuin tuota yhteiskunnan jäseninä. Kumppanuudella me halutaan painottaa sitä, että kaikkia osapuolia hyödyttävää tällaista niin erityistä arvoa ja luottamusta tuottavaa yhdessä toimimista. Ja toisaalta vähän, vähän tota noin sama asia, mutta kuitenkin eri tulokulmasta 
ollaan nostettu myös yhteiskehittämisen arvo, jolla me sitten tarkoitetaan sitä, että asioita kehitetään yhdessä erityistä tukea tarvitsevien ihmisten ja heidän läheisten ja muiden toimijoiden kanssa sillä tavalla, että niistä palveluista ja tuesta tulee tota noin, ihmisten toiveita ja tarpeita vastaavia. Ja toisaalta me ollaan jo pitkän aikaakin noudatettu tällaista kokeilemalla kehittämisen periaatetta, sitä, että ollaan, toimitaan ennakkoluulottomasti ja rohkeasti niin, että tunnistetaan niitä erilaisia esteitä ja löydetään ratkaisuja ja opitaan, opitaan asioista. Mm. Ja täh, tähän mennessä ollaan mietitty, että se meidän toiminta tulee olemaan, olemaan myös tällä tavalla niin kuin viiden, viiden kulman kautta hahmotettavissa. Jatketaan sitä kokeiluluontoista ja myöhemmin mahdollisesti tota noin laajemminkin sitä sellaista niin kuin ihmisten kanssa rinnalla kulkemista ja, ja suunnitellaan niitä henkilökohtaisia budjetteja. Meidän tehtävänä on sen palvelumuotoilu ja kokeilemalla toimimisen periaatteita hyödyntäen sitten olla, olla kumppaneiden tukena. Ja tarjotaan toki, toki edelleenkin sitä kaikenlaista koulutusta ja konsultaatiota. Toivottavasti tulevaisuudessa myöhemmin enemmänkin vielä tutkittaisiin, tuotettaisiin, kerättäisiin ja jaettaisiin jaettaisi tietoa. Tähän mennessä meillä on ollut sen verran kiire toimia noiden meidän kumppaneiden kanssa, että tätä meillä on pystytty vielä paljon tekemään, mutta toivottavasti tulevaisuudessa vähän, vähän paremmin otetaan tästäkin tämä juttu haltuun. Ja että yhdistettäisiin ihmisiä ja rakennettaisiin ja vahvistettaisiin erilaisia tähän liittyviä tota noin, verkostoja. Ja nämä nyt sellaisia alkuajatuksia ja että tosiaan sillä yhdessä tekemisellä Toivottavasti näitä sitten tavoitteita ja toimintatapoja sitten tota pystytään mukauttamaan aina sen tarpeen mukaan ja ne elää sitten sen mukaan, mitä, mitä milloinkin, milloinkin tarvitsee. Mm. Näin lyhyesti tästä asiasta, koska mä palaan ainakin halusta kuulla, kuulla tota Simonia ja Kiittiä ma- mahdollisimman nopeasti. Mulla on ollut ilo ja kunnia olla useammassakin tilaisuudessa aiemmin, missä he on, he on ollut puhumassa ja aina, aina tuntuu, että kynä saa, kun kirjoittelen asioita aina lisää. Niin tota, ehkä annan Kirsille vielä puheenvuoron, jos hän haluaa vielä jotain kommentoida ja, ja sitten spiikata tota meidän, meidän puhujat sisälle. Kiit. Joo, kiitos. Kiitos, Petteri. Tosissaan tänään on siis tämän suuntakeskuksen lanseeraus tämä seminaari samalla, samalla ja Petteri kertoi tuossa näistä, mitä ajatuksia ja, ja meillä on ja todellakin ajatuksena on se, että me kootaan tässä sitä työtä, mitä me on jo vuosia tehty, jäsennetään budjetoinnin eteen ja, ja ollaan sillä tavalla, halutaan olla kum, vahva kumppani alueella ihmisille, jotka sitä käytännössä pohtii sitä, että mitä se henkilökohtainen budjetointi, valinnanvapaus tarkoittaa. Tarkoittaa kullakin alueella ja, ja ihmisille sitten tukea tarvitseville henkilöille ja läheisille myös. Uh, if it, mä vaihdan nyt kieltä. I will switch the language now uh, to introduce our, our guests uh, um, from UK. Uh, we have been happy uh, to be able to develop uh, self-directed support uh, persons at the planning uh, personal budgets uh, for we yesterday we calculated that almost a decade together with our uh, partners from UK who have of course already quite extensive uh, experience of, of uh, how to do it and of the outcomes and so on. So it has been, I think, great privilege for us to work together uh, with our, our partners there. And also, I think it has been great opportunity to welcome them to visit us every now and then. At the moment, uh, we are working also together in, in one international project around the topic, which is called Skills. And, and also, all the time we are reflecting our ideas, what can self-directed support be in Finland, how should we organize things here together with them. So I think it has, it's very useful and, and great relationship what we are having. Uh, now I'm very happy to welcome Simon Duffy uh, on stage. Uh, uh, Simon has been indeed a partner uh, a long time very much the basics of the what person, personal budget is in Finland is, is founded together with him. 
And I think you will switch uh, by yourself when it's right time with Keith Errington from Scotland, from In Control Scotland. With Keith, we are uh, working uh, in skills project and, and uh, Keith is doing uh, quite similar work in Scotland, what we are planning to do in, in this, our Sunda centre. Warm well, welcome, and I think we can, um, they will speak, and we have a lot of time for questions and, and so on. I will facilitate the questions and answers session afterwards, and, and also you are, you can think your questions also in Finnish, if, if it's easier for you, and we can then translate them, so don't be shy with your questions, think about them all the time. So, Simon, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kirsi. Uh, hi, moi. <laughs> My finish stops there. <laughs> Yesterday I was, uh, we were working together and I, uh, uksi, kaksi, and then, oh, kolme. <laughs> So anyway, we won't do the whole thing now, but uh, I, I've got some, but it, it keeps disappearing. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here 10 years after um, a, a very interesting group of Finns arrived in my home city, which is Sheffield. And we were, the council gave us a tiny room not, not nowhere near enough for all the Finns in the room. And, and I, I remember standing with a big flip chart board and trying to explain all of these things because there were no facilities, no technology. Um, so it's lovely to see some of the same people here today and to, and to be here at the launch of Sunta and, um, and to have been able to help a little bit in uh, the development of thinking in Finland about self-directed support. Um, I'm going to do a very um, introductory session, try and explain some of the core concepts. Some, some people in the room will have heard some of this kind of thing before, but I'm going to try and think about getting the basics right is very important with self-directed support. And then Keith is going to talk about this in Scotland in, in, and the practical implementation in Scotland and progress in Scotland. And then after lunch, I will come back and think and talk a little bit about implementation and some of the positives and negatives around implementation and some of the things you, as you move forward now, you've got to try and avoid in Finland because there is many things to be achieved, but there's also things that can go wrong. But I'll talk talk to you ab about that in the, the afternoon session when you've got your lunch in your stomach and a little drink maybe. Okay, so um, this talk, as Kirsi mentions, um, is also rooted in work that we're starting to do in Europe and actually globally. So we have a European project, but also uh, two years ago we launched uh, an international project called Citizen Network, which is actually connecting people all around the world who are learning about self-directed support. So the, the reality, and this is a strange reality, is that self-directed support has actually been emerging for 50 years, 50 years. So that's good because that means there's lots of experience. It's good because it's happened um, in lots of different places. It's also a little bit worrying that it still seems to take quite a long time and, and maybe it's not um, always as easy as it appears. So one of the publications that we produced um, in the Skills Project says, um, if it's so good, then why is it so hard? And, and this is a really important thing. It is good, but it is also hard to implement. In, in many respects, it's, it's really the next phase of deinstitutionalization. And we know that deinstitutionalization is itself a hard process, and there are many obstacles on the path from the institution to full citizenship. So, so what is it? 
It was great to hear Serpa talk about the human rights as the foundation for this. This is absolutely correct. And it is strange that we will often reference the idea of human rights. We'll talk about human rights broadly and forget what is the number one right. The number one right is freedom. Is that Vapaus? Yeah, that guy's here. So you see there's some things stored in there. So Vapaus, it's a simple human right. It's a fundamental human right. Um, there it is. It's Article 1 of the UN Declaration. It's the first principle of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But is it designed into the way that we support people? No, not really. Um, in, in my work at the Centre for Welfare Reform, we've been talking about this for a while and publishing articles. Uh, one, of the, one of the articles up here is, is called Social Rights Are Human Rights. Social Rights, Social and Economic Rights. Um, but also the human right to be free, in a way, needs to be inside the way we understand these social and economic rights. I think it's still useful to think about the way we organise um, supports for people with disabilities and, and ask ourselves, why is it still the case that the primary system is what I call the professional gift model, the one on your left? So where the, quite rightly, the community gathers resources for people with disabilities, but it does not transfer that power to people with disabilities. It transfers that to the government. And then the government and we need government, we need a welfare state, then the government says we will now transfer those resources to professionals, and really the professionals start buying services for people with disabilities or organising services or turning themselves into services, and then provide those services as a gift. But a gift is not a right, a gift is not an entitlement, a gift is not something we can control. I like presents. I, 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 you reminded me of the present of the socks you gave me a few years ago. I still have those socks, and finished socks always make me feel very happy. But I can't live my life from presents. I, I need to be able to control things that I need for, for me, for my wife, for my family. Um, we need to be citizens. We need to have rights entitlements, things we can control. We need to build our life in community as part of the community. We do need good professional assistance, but we need to be able to control the assistance, find the right kind of assistance. So we really need to, so we don't need to throw anybody away. Yes, we, we, we're all citizens together, but we need to change the power relationships so that people can be full citizens uh, with no um, exceptions. So I've explained these things really. So again, just to reflect on this, this long history, the, the, there are threads coming together. Um, you know, the, the, probably the first example of self-directed support is the work of Ed Roberts and people with disabilities in California in the late 1960s. Lots of good things came out of California in the 1960s. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, so it's very important, people with disabilities claiming their rights, claiming back control, giving birth to the independent living movement. But it's a complex... Uh, I'm thinking of the sock now all the time. So it's like threads, isn't it? Because then also in Canada, there was a family movement. And the fam families were saying, families of, of people with intellectual disabilities were saying the same thing. We want our sons and daughters to be citizens. And that means we don't want to accept the services that are just on offer. We want, um, and they talked about brokerage. Um, and they wanted a sit individual funding, but good assistance to help them find the right way forward. Then, of course, the other thread is 
deinstitutionalization itself. Now, deinstitutionalization, you know, in Finland, you're still in the middle of this process. Uh, it took, I think in, in England, it took us uh, 35 years to close all the big institutions. These things take a long time. Um, and even now, we have kind of private sector institutions that have grown up small ones that we need to get rid of. Um, so this is a, it's a long, complex process. What we discovered is that quite often, when we close a big institution, we replace it with a small institution. We close a big institution, we replace it with the, the word in English, but it goes back to the Jewish experience in the Middle Ages, is a ghetto. It's a place in the community, but not of the community. It's separated. And, and there might be a little bit of movement backwards and forwards, but it's clearly, oh, you belong there, we belong here. And lots of our services today have that feeling. that we, So we don't maybe have the big institutions, but have we really created vibrant community lives? I don't think so. Then we have the human rights movement. So we have the UN Declaration just after World War II. And then we have efforts like the UN Convention, which is to say the, the UN Declaration is still the foundation, but we need to think a bit harder about how it implies to different groups. So there's been thoughts about persons with disabilities and with children and other groups to make sure that we're really paying attention. And it's been, it's been a challenge for people to really think through what those rights mean in public services. There's been another wave which I would, I mean, give the title public service reform. This is a little bit more mixed. There's some good things in it, like we need to think differently about public services. There's some bad things in it. We were at a little session for the, for the press this morning looking at the, the not for sale campaign. The, the, uh, unfortunately, sometimes public service reform has turned into um, just another version of the professional gift model, but now people with disabilities are for sale. You can buy them. You can buy their lives. And even worse, you buy them by offering the lowest price. This is a disastrous policy and it's had very damaging consequences in um, England. So this is the background. It's a complex background. Um, and, um, but what, what does it mean in practice? Um, I, my attempt to try and understand this, you, in a funny way, things actually start more complex and get simpler, and then they get more complex, and then they get simpler again. So I've been thinking about this and doing things for, oh, goodness, 30, 30 years or so now. It's a long time. Um, but I think this is my best attempt to understand the fundamentals. Number one is that, that people, people have rights. And, and the talking about uh, I always find that the, the Finnish word too difficult. Henki la kotaisen budgetioinin. It's very difficult for an English. But the, the individual budget, the personal budget, um, it is important, but it's really just making clear the rights that people have. It's moving from the rights as a vague idea to what does that mean? In English, we say you have a, a right to support, but what's your entitlement? We say, how does that right cash out? What does it mean in practice for me with my particular needs? So that's what, so this whole personal budget language is really just another way of talking about rights. That, that, that right to support and to be included has to turn into something clear that somebody can control. Then the other thing, of course, is that that right enables freedom, which is itself another right. I make choices about my life. In systems and services, this sometimes 
uh, turns into having a plan. Although, I, I, I wonder how many people in the room have a plan. Yeah. So we have to be really careful here. We might have an idea, we might have objectives, but how many have a plan that they're being told by a social worker about what to do? <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, plans, we, it's not about having a plan, it's about being free. Sometimes plans are useful to help us understand what we're going to do, what might be involved, the practicalities. And sometimes people need help to plan, but again, the person should decide who's helping them to plan. Yes, um, so we need to be flexible and thoughtful about planning. And the third element, which again is a human right, is the right to participate, to be part of your community, to turn up, to do things, to go to the shops, to go swimming, to have a job, to vote in an election, to be a councillor, to be an MS MEP. You know, these, these are basic political, social, economic rights, and they involve being involved in your community. Services remain an important part of their community. They're not bad, they're good, but they must not get in the way of people playing their part in community. And it's really these three things together, our rights, our freedoms, our participation, that enables us to be citizens. This is actually... Um, so this is being a little, my, uh, my background before getting involved in, in the practical work of being, um, helping people with disabilities and families with these kind of problems and system problems is as a philosopher. And it's very interesting that there are many deep truths in the experience of people with disabilities that are, that are very philosophical and very powerful. One of these is that actually equality, being equal and being different, can be reconciled through the idea of being a citizen who comes together in community. We sometimes confuse equality with being the same, yes, being just the same, and that's actually wrong. Actually, we're all different. Every single one of us is different. And we know that not only are we different, but being different is good. It's a good thing. So how can we be different and equal? Because we come together and we say, I'm going to treat you as an equal. I'm going to treat you as somebody who has equal value, equal worth. So actually, self-directed support is just part of this effort for us to make sense of our differences and to treat each other as equals. And then, then for constructing rights that give us freedoms and give us responsibilities is what a good society does. A society like Finland trying to work out how do we include everybody. We need to have freedom, we need to have rights, we need to have duties. But as I say, this is not easy. So that makes self-directed support sound like we can just, ah oh, yes, We'll just change things, we'll just reorganise things, and now people will be in control. Well, it's quite difficult. Of course, people lack knowledge of what they're entitled to. Perhaps even more fundamentally, the system often doesn't know how to give people knowledge of what they're entitled to. It doesn't know how to tell somebody a personal budget. Uh, because it's not, it's not organised to think like that. That's not how things have worked. People are not free to plan, and the system's assumption is that it's the system's job to plan. So helping people to be free and giving people good support to make their own plans requires fundamental changes in the way things are organised. And one of the fundamental assumptions of the professional gift model is that everything the system has purchased or funded 
everything the system does is good, and so anything that people want to do differently is bad. But that doesn't make any sense. So it's, but it becomes a huge issue to try and get the system to spend money differently or to enable people to spend money differently. There's no point to self-directed support if people can't spend the money differently. If it's just a complicated way of doing what we would have done before, why do it? But then once people start to have freedom and control, immediately they start saying, well, I want to do this now, or I want to do this. And the system goes, oh, no, no, you can't do that. And fundamentally, the, the respect and seeing somebody as an equal is still not there in our society. So those prejudices, that, that, that view of people as lacking capacity to be free is still very powerful, not just across professional systems, but across the whole of society. So these are reasons why it's not easy. We can make progress, but we must not be naive and recognise that there's work to be done together. So what have we learnt? Well, the good news is there is lots of research to show that self-direct support helps people have better lives. In fact, there's no research which shows uh, people having worse lives. They always have better lives with self-direct support. The good news is that sometimes people can lead better lives and actually money is spent more efficiently by people. Now, the reason why sometimes that's not true is you can design systems of self-directed support that are wasteful. So one of the really important things to think about in the design of a system is to make it efficient. Not because you want to, well, I don't want to save money for the government or the taxpayer personally, but I want to see that money in the hands of people with disabilities and families and in being spent in communities on on better lives. So it is a real responsibility to think about how the financial side is organised to make sure that the money goes in the right direction. But a lot of the research is not so good at actually the, the details, strangely. Often researchers, I've found, tend to be rather simplistic about how self-directed support works. They think almost that it's a big word like personal budgets that is determining what's different. But these words and jargon and system changes don't make the difference. It's human beings, interactions, new ways of organising things, and we need to understand the details better. And the other problem is a lot of the academic research and government research doesn't even ask the right questions about what we're trying to achieve. It's really important to think about this from a human rights perspective, and that's actually also how we do the research needs to be from a human rights perspective. We've tried to, through the Centre for Welfare Reform, publish um, our learning and share that, so all of these things are freely available, and there is a lot of information available. And these are the kind of things we see. This is a very small um, early pilot in England, but I think it's just a nice example of, of kind of... Um, well, we've even got Sunta as the, <laughs> the, the key variable. So the kind of improvements that we're seeing in terms of the, the sense of purpose in people's lives, in terms of the money that people have, home, the, the freedom, other benefits in terms of health, in terms of personal security and safety. Here people talk about, um, again, this, this, is, this is from a, an organisation that um, I set up in Glasgow in, in 1996, where the service provider enabled people to use their budget flexibly um, and, and very significant changes in people's quality of life. This is from a local authority um, in the north of England called Barnsley. Again, very significant. So there are lots of these things. This is, a, this is another uh, project. This is research from families talking about the impact they saw on their sons' and daughters' lives. 
Um, set in this case, there were quite significant savings, and people were saying these savings have been made without any harm to people's lives. I always like to use this one. This is looking at the experience of professionals themselves through this change process. And a large number of professionals, social workers, support workers saying, doing this, working in this different way, giving power and control to people has been one of the most positive experiences in my life. So shifting power away from professionals is very empowering for good professionals because they enter into a new relationship with people with disabilities that is more positive, more um, educational actually because they're learning in a different way with people. And again, a kind of tough research, but this was a, a big research project um, in England, showed that, well, sadly, there were still cases of abuse, so you can't be naive. There were still cases of abuse when people were in control of their own budget. But it was half the level of abuse when people weren't in control. So important things to think about here, but what we learn is that freedom control, getting power towards people, leaves people significantly safer. But we also learn it does not magically remove every risk from people's lives. So we still need to be thinking, why does it work? Okay. This is a really important issue. Really important issue. Um, and I'm very lucky that my friend John O'Brien helped me, offered me a way of understanding why the innovations that we were doing were working. Um, and John pointed me to um, some Harvard economists um, called uh, Hag John Hagel and Celie Brown, John and Celie Brown, who developed a distinction between push economics and pull economics. Now, what's this difference? Well, push economics is a bit like the professional gift model. We'll spend money for you. We'll decide how to provide services for Petri. We'll spend the money on this. And we will hope that Petri will get value from it. Now, often Petri will get some value from it. We mean well. We try and do a good job. Petri will get some value from it. He's not saying that all of these decisions are terrible or stupid, but they're not Petri's decisions. But also, because we don't know Petri, we just know we're going to provide this residential service, or we're going to provide this day service, or this respite service. So we design the service, and then we fit Petri in. But Petri knows, he knows his community. He knows who his friends are. He knows who his family is. Petri and the people around Petri know who his gifts, what his gifts are, what he loves, what he hates, what gets him out of the bed in the morning, we say in English, what makes him excited. Yes? Petri may also have other gifts, and his family may also have other resources, other talents, but also maybe connections, energy, money, things that they already have that they can use. And of course, Petri is part of a community. He's connected to things and his life will be led in that community. You can only see these things really from Petri's perspective, being alongside Petri and looking out at the world from Petri, being Petri, being somebody who cares about Petri. You cannot see these things from within government offices in Helsinki, or even government offices in Tampere. Yes, you have to be in the person's shoes. So pull economics is saying, yes, the personal budget is useful because it can be woven in, again, like those socks, it can be woven in with all the other things in Petri's life. But you can only do it if you shift the power and control towards Petri. Does that make sense? This is, this is fundamentally important, I think. And again, a, a kind of 
a sharp way of putting this is the old system spends people's money for them, spends people's money for them on things they wouldn't buy for themselves. So this is terrible economics. And, and this is um, a slide combining data from changes in day services. So in, in places in England, people started to get control of their day service. So we, our day services are sometimes called adult training centres, workshops. So people where people would go for their whole day and do things, and some of those things are okay, and some of those things uh, maybe people didn't love so much, because it was all provided and set up. And there might be a hundred or so people going. And instead people get their, their budget and they say, well, what am I going to do? Well, one of the things you can see from this data is in one place, Cambridgeshire, nobody used any of their budget on the day centre. And so, I mean, this is quite shocking, maybe even frightening, but sometimes people are saying, we don't want any of this. What we want instead is we want to go and use community resources. Everything that's happening inside the day centre, there's a better version of that in the community. If you have bowling in the day centre, you've probably got somewhere to go bowling with your friends in the community. And people can still... Be, this is not all about people with disabilities going off by themselves and doing things. Often people can put their money together and go and do things together. But why can't they do that in community? Because the community is rich with resources. And of course we want those communities to flourish. Small towns and villages across whole of Finland, we don't want resources drawn into day centres and residential. We want those resources in those communities. We want flourishing shops and flourishing leisure centres and swimming pools and schools and training places and employees and employers, businesses in our communities. So we want people with disabilities to be contributing back and exchanging resources in those communities. So you can see from this Really, the data shows us that when people have really real choice and control and good chance to think through their options, they do the work of deinstitutionalization. Yes, they do the work of drawing resources back into community life and citizenship. You know, and this is what citizenship is about. It's having a life of meaning, freedom, enough money to be independent, home, where you belong, getting help, but also giving back, contributing to the life of the community and building together our lives of love. This is how we find love, it's how we find friendship, it's through these processes of community building. This is my friend Wendy, who actually helped me with the, the, the model, she helped me get rid of some of the language I used to talk. Instead of VAP house, I used to talk about, I can't remember the finish for it, self-determination. Wendy says, why, why, why use this complicated language? Freedom, better. Yeah, and she said, why is there nothing about sex in your model? Yeah, and then I said, well, I can't really write about sex. I'm not so good at it, but I can write about love, maybe. You know, so why, yes, love should be in our model of citizenship. And... So people like Wendy, with her personal budget, she said, I don't want physiotherapy, I want to go to the gym. It's a really good example, I think, of, you know, if you want to do the exercise, do go and do the exercises, not in a hospital, not in a clinic, in the gym, where you will meet people and you will, you will do something you enjoy and something that has value in the community. Helen um, had a brain injury after a car accident the, the service that she was given by social services, because all the staff were employed by social services, was, and I, I am 53 years old, so I'm not, it's no comment on anybody in the room, but all of the support workers were 50, 60-year-old women. Yes? She was a 20-year-old young woman, very beautiful young woman. She wants support from people of her age to participate in the community as an equal. Yes? So it doesn't make sense for her to go into the community with a, somebody who looks like a mother when she's trying to l meet people and do fun things. 
Yes, she needs more assistance now, but she's not a totally different person. She's, she's still the same person. Stephen was institutionalised in one of these private sector institutions, costing, um, well, £150,000, actually. Well, it's, a, it's a bit less now, but, uh, you know, it's like this is 200, 200 or more thousand euros a year for one person. And I said to the family, I was working with a local authority, tell the family half the budget that's current. Well, tell them the whole budget, but tell them they can probably do this for half the budget. And they did. And again, Stephen and his family and his brother designed the whole service. And they got him out of the institution. He bought a home himself, and he's living in the village next to where his parents live and living a very good life with good support designed by the family. So again, not only is this about community life and citizenship, but it's also about using the intelligence of the people who know people best. So I think what the research shows is, is that we, the, the, the big improvements are because people focus on things they really want to do. So of course your life gets much better if you do the things that are really important to you. And the flip side of that is you can also stop doing things you didn't really value. You can say, I don't want to do that anymore. I never enjoyed it. I was only doing it because I had to do it. You can also get the professional support that you value. In other research from the United States, we saw for physiotherapy services using a model a bit like this. Actually, when they started to use this model, about a third of the physiotherapy services went out of business. But a whole new range of physiotherapists came into the community because people actually said, before I had no choice, I didn't really use these services. And also I was overusing the service because I had to use it up. Because if I stopped using it, yes, it would be completely taken off me. But when people had more control, they would use the bit of the service and to a level that they wanted, and that freed up resources so that more people could get physiotherapy services. Um, as we've said, people can use it to enhance their community life. But number five is really important. Because of the way the world is, because people have for 40 years got completely confused about things and they've lost sight, we, we have often people reinterpreting all of this back into, we call it in English, neoliberalism or market <laughs> economics. Now, I'm not opposed to markets. I think they're useful things. But let us be absolutely clear. There is no evidence, no evidence, that market effects are at working here at all in the sense that people are not choosing services and they're not choosing between different price points. They're choosing life. They're choosing a good life. So it's very important not to get confused by this because what happens is because people are confused about this, they, Im they start building the wrong kind of self-directed support systems. They start offering people consumer choices but forget to give people community citizen choices. So this is one of the big risks in Finland, I would suggest. It's very important that you're listening carefully to people with disabilities, you're listening carefully to families, you're listening carefully to the people who really are doing this and understanding it. So this works, I think, in terms of process because People now know much earlier what their budget is. So telling people the budget clearly, early, really helps. If you know the budget, then you can think about it and you can be creative. It works because people are making their own plans. It's coming from the person and from the people around them. They're coming... The social worker is still very important, but the social worker is more there to help people get the plan right, help agree it, and they can use the, it's very important that people can use their budget flexibly, and if they want to take direct control, good, 
but if they want to use some other mechanism, also good. It's really important that the money itself can be flexible. It's really important that people can um, use it in the community. And that when we're checking, reviewing, finding out how it's going, that we keep it really human, that we're focused on, is the person achieving what's important to them? We had this kind of, we talked about this in, uh, in England in the, in, two, in the year 2003 when I was running this project as the seven steps of in control. So here's Zoe, she finds out her budget, she's planning with her father, she meets with the social worker, she decides to use her budget through her bank, she organises her assistance locally, she lives her life, she meets with the social worker. That's just Zoe. Many people will make different choices. You need processes that open to different kind of paths. I would say that we found the, this kind of graphical approach very, very useful. And you know, it wasn't just useful for people with disabilities and families. It was useful for the professionals. It was the professionals I saw using these simple, to, to get it in their heads. It, it was much clearer. So again, one of the real challenges for self-direct support is to make sure that you don't overcomplicate the way you describe things. You will find a Finnish way of doing this, but you need to keep it simple and human or it will all become lost. So in terms of process, the being clear about the money is a big difference in the process because it's being clear about the money that enables people to plan with meaning. You can't really plan if you know nothing about the budget and the, the budget is already paying for services. You're just planning for services that you think you might get because they're already funded. So it's really important, this, this thing about the money, it's really important. It becomes part of the conversation in a good way. And it's really important that people have these different options. So yes, people can control it themselves. Yes, family can control it, but maybe having systems that peers, independent living centres can help manage it, advocates or brokers, actually service providers themselves are quite appropriate for people to themselves manage budgets sometimes, um, and also you may have the social worker sometimes managing the budget. Yes, you want much more down in, in the Scottish model, Keith will talk about option one, or option two, maybe option three, you want less. But, you know, it's a process, and certainly you want all those options available. Um, there are always circumstances where um, different, some people, direct control is not the ideal model. So this is from some research we did a year or so ago around personalised support, which is also an aspect of self-direct support. And you can see here, I'm not going to run through it, that... These ideas apply to so many different groups. So yes, people with physical disabilities for 50 years have been showing us that they can be in control. But we also know that people with intellectual disabilities, children, people with complex health problems, people with mental health problems, all sorts of everybody who needs extra assistance really, this assistance can be made respectful. This assistance can be put under that person's control. Sometimes we need, you know, to design the right support around that. But, it, but there's no really, nobody who doesn't, um, this doesn't work for. So, you know, people with physical disabilities and normal, and Finland has good systems around personal assistance. So this is good. That's a, it's a good pathway. It works for some people. So some people like to be an employer. But not everybody wants to be an employer. And being an employer, if, if you're at the end of life or you've got a big health condition, you're not going to become an employer of your personal assistance. So you need different solutions. And people with intellectual disabilities, this works really well. But again, people with intellectual disabilities have intellectual disabilities. So they need a bit of extra thought and care around planning and thinking about how to manage things. Yeah, older people are at the end of life, their support arrangements are going to reflect that. Um, they still need 
dignity, respect, control, flexibility. People with mental health problems, one of the most powerful things from the literature is the power of peer support for people with mental health problems. A really interesting model in America saw personal budgets combined with a peer support. Somebody is helping you decide how to spend your personal budget who has lived experience of mental health problems. Very powerful, very effective. In England, we've seen progress. So direct payments is, is, is the option one, full or partial control. We also see problems. We see systems that are still stuck. It's been a very long journey. And in Scotland, we've also seen significant progress. This data is a little bit out of date, so I think the latest research I haven't done the new slides for, um, but we're now in, in several th tens of thousands of people in the self-directed support system in Scotland, which is a good time to hand over to Keith. You need this. <laughs> oh. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, well, yeah, that's good. That's good. Ready for takeoff. Good. Um, so I arrived in Finland um, late on Monday night, um, and I've learned some things already. And the very first thing I've learned that I want to say is, huomenta <laughs> kaikala. Okay. That's the, that's the best bit, that's the best bit. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Keith Etherington, um, and I work for In Control Scotland. And uh, the title of my short presentation is Self-Directed Support, Finding the Right Direction for You. I'm just going to start very briefly um, saying a few things about In Control Scotland. Um, we have been active for 10 years, for slightly more than 10 years. So In Control Scotland as an organization has been active doing things since about late 2006, um, but as a separate and constituted organization, so as a formal charity um, in the third sector, since 2009. So we've been operating as an organization since August 2009. And what we're about is very simple really. We're not about providing services to people. We're about supporting and promoting a sustainable system of self-directed support that works for people. So our role is to help self-directed support work for people. Um, and our aim is the transformation of the system of social care in Scotland so that self-directed support can work really well for everyone. Um, we work with and alongside people and organisations to try and make self-directed support work. Um, another way to describe that would be to support successful implementation across Scotland. 
and we are funded from a mixture of places. When we first started, we were funded only from um, membership fees. So organisations would pay us what was called a membership fee and we would help them to think about how self-directed support could either work in their area or work for the people who they were already supporting or might be thinking about supporting in the future. Um, now we're funded from a mixture um, of grants, including grants from the Scottish Government, from training and consultancy, and from membership fees. And that's changed and, and over the years and will continue to change. Um, I want to start with a quote. Uh, and I just want you to think about this little quote. Uh, think about who might have said this. So the quote is, the social care brackets, self-directed support brackets, Scotland Act 2013 is potentially the most important piece of legislation in recent times that can help people to get the right support. So I just want you to think about who might have said that and we'll come back to it at the end. Um, when we think about self-directed support in Scotland, um, we think about three things. We think about the legislation, so that's the law that describes the duties and expectations around self-directed support. We think about the local and national plans of how we should do things, so that's the local policies. And we think about the way that things happen, and that's the practice around self-directed support. Um, and our In Control Scotland's role is principally focused around the practice, about how it works, how it can be sustained, and how people can get lives and support that work for them. So, to take us back, take us back to um, what's, all this, what's all this about? Um, just really simply to say that self-directed support is only about people being able to have a good life. If self-directed support isn't doing that, isn't delivering that, if by people directing their own support, they're not getting a good life, we need to think about why that is, we may need to change some of the way that things happen, but a good life is the purpose of self-directed support. Sometimes that's also described as people being able to have equal citizenship, Simon has already talked about citizenship and described aspects of that. Um, often people talk about independent living as well as being the goal of self-directed support. So just to look at this in a slightly different way, um, good life is the goal, self-directed support is the route that takes us to that goal, and the individual budget, or the personal budget, or the funding, what, however we describe that, is the vehicle that takes us down the route to that good life. Um, just something about some more about self-directed support. Um, just to dispel that mystery, in a sense. Self-directed support is just a term. It's just a, 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 a num three words which were joined together that was developed to describe a way of doing things where the person or their family would be in control of deciding how they would use all the resources available to them to get the life and support that they want. So again, that idea of focusing on, on your whole life and using whatever resources are available to you to get the life and support that works for you. And the ideas of self-directed support in the United Kingdom were first developed so that people who didn't want to choose a direct payment, direct payments were already in, in place, or were deemed not to have the capacity to do so, would still have a similar level of choice and control. So it was that idea that everyone should be able to have choice, control and flexibility around their support, irrespective of the way that they chose to either use the money or direct their own support. So In Control Scotland would say these things. We would say self-directed support for everyone, but not necessarily at all times. So, for example, if you have a crisis in your life or a crisis in your personal circumstances, you don't want to be thinking about how you develop a plan for that. What you want is the crisis to finish. But self-directed support itself as an approach 
is suitable for everyone. Simon showed us a list of the different of people with different labels who, who use self-directed support. Um, and in the UK, oh, sorry, in Scotland specifically, not, not necessarily, I'm not sure about actually about the rest of the UK, but in Scotland, what we would say is um, self-directed support is the way that people access social care. So anyone who has an additional need uses the system of self-directed support to access the support and services that work for them. Um, I also want to emphasize this, this point that Simon also did touch on, which is that um, self-directed support is much more than just getting better at buying and directing your own sub support. It's much more than that idea of better shopping, of being able to use, to buy things more efficiently. It's essentially about that idea of citizenship and independent living and social justice, people being able to achieve their, their universal human rights that all of us within any society should expect and should expect our state and our government to help us to achieve. Um, and it's also an active process, so it's not something that you get. Sometimes you hear people talking about, I've got self-directed support. The way that we would describe self-directed support is it, it's something that you do. So I direct my own support. I don't get self-directed support. I direct my own support in a way that works for me. Um, this slide that I've put up just now is a slide that was used um, when, an old, when there was a, a public body in Scotland that was looking at what is the, what's the purpose of the self-directed support system. Um, so we were just trying to think around the purpose of the system of self-directed support. And it's got, it's got um, two things, and then it's got an underpinning, an underpinning um, basis at the bottom. In one of the one of the slides, I used this. I used this as a as a equilibrium, or I used it as a as a balance. But actually, I took out the balance because I don't think it is about balance. But I think these things are important. Um, and the purpose of the self direct support system to enable people to have choice, control, and flexibility in their support, and also to manage all the resources available efficiently and effectively. Um, and the underpinning line below that is that what we've said already it's about people having a good life support and services that make sense to me when we've talked to families we've said what what do you think self-directed support is is about people say it's about support and services that make sense to me and my family so a very quick note about independent living and citizenship in fact i probably won't do the note about citizenship because simon's already um given a better description than, I, than I've included in my short slide. But I just wanted to make a reference to independent living. For in Scotland, we have a formal definition almost of independent living. Not almost, we actually have a formal definition of independent living. Um, and it's this, that independent living doesn't mean living on your own, necessarily. And it doesn't mean living without support. Independent living means all disabled people having the same freedom, choice, dignity and control as other citizens at home, at work and in the community. It doesn't mean living by yourself or fending for yourself necessarily. It means having access to the right, it means rights to practical assistance and support to participate in society and live an ordinary life. So that's the formal definition of, of what we're trying to achieve there. Um, I... Um, Somebody asked me yesterday how long I've been talking to people from Finland. I couldn't really remember. And then I met somebody in the audience who was saying, you gave me a book about sex a few years ago. We, we realized it was a book that had been written by a group of organizations around, around um, relationships and sex for disabled people. And, and it was a very, I think it's a very useful book. Um, but more recently, we've had a lot of people from Finland who are interested in self-directed support, personal budgets, who, 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 who've been talking to us either through the skills project or through other, other projects that are involved in. And in April, we had a group of 59 people from, from uh, 
think it was 30 from KVPS, but also 29 from one of the personal budget projects who came over to Scotland, and we organised a mini, a mini um, study tour. And on day two, I gave people a piece of paper and asked them what, what was the key messages that they were getting from what they'd heard so far. They'd heard from, they'd visited some organisations, they'd heard from um, families, from individuals, from people working in the system. And what was very heartening for me was uh, that the, one of the, the most remarkable thing that came out from that um, evalu mini evaluation was that people said that what we really like is the focus on human rights that we, that we he hear wherever we go in Scotland. So I thought, actually, we must be doing something <laughs> a little bit right, so that's good. Okay, so the essence of self-directed support, just again, this idea of choice, choice over how and when and what way support's provided, control, flexibility, collaboration. These are the four key words that, that if I'm talking about self-directed support to people, I would always use. Um, choice, control, flexibility, collaboration. And what we have in place in Scotland. So we have, we have um, a number of things in place in Scotland. Um, we have a national strategy around self-directed support. The national strategy has been in place since um, the autumn of 2010. Um, there are 21 recommendations in the national strategy for self-directed support. Some of them, we're now eight years into that, some of them have been achieved, some of them haven't been achieved, some of them are no longer relevant because the world's different since then. But the... the um, the objectives that relate to the strategy are reviewed every so often and are due for review at the end of this, at the end of this year. Um, we have legislation about self-directed support. So we have uh, the, the Act, which I referred to earlier. We have statutory guidance. We have guidance that goes with the legislation. So that's, um, that is 120-something pages long, the statutory guidance. So that means that any public body who are implementing, who have the duties and expectations to Im that they need to implement from the legislation, needs also to follow the statutory guidance. Um, we have good practice guidance. Um, we have national funding to support the implementation. We have funding from Scottish Government. And we have several years of practice. The implementation funding is split in three ways. A third of it, roughly a third of it, goes to local authorities those local um, organisations who have responsibility for implementation. Roughly a third of it goes to the third sector, to charities and other groups who are providing either information, advice and support for people thinking about self-directed support or who've been funded to innovate and or what's called develop the workforce, develop people working in services. And the other third goes to national organisations like what we have is called the Scottish Social Services Council and their responsibility is everybody who works in the sector. So national organisations like that. Um, so here is the strategy and legislation. 10-year strategy from t 10 to 20. Um, the Act which came in, which is called the Social Care self Direct Support Act 2013, but actually came into force four years ago on April the 1st, 2014. So um, quite, quite a structure, quite a history of self-directed support with principles in, in law as well. So these are, the, these are the principles that are stated within the legislation. So anyone who comes into contact with a public body because they have uh, some additional need they present themselves. These are the way. These are the ways that the law says they should be treated. It says that that you sh you should ex you should feel like you are able to collaborate with those people who are coming to contact you with you, whether that's about assessment, the initial assessment, or whether about it's the planning. You should feel that you're treated with dignity, that you have you're able to make informed choices because you have the right information both about self-directed support and local services. You should feel you're involved throughout the whole process and you should feel that you're able to participate, not just in things that relate to you, but also in the development 
uh, of policy and practice locally. So, um, that one came up slightly differently on my front, but that's good. Um, the Act came into force on the 1st of April and places a duty on local authority social work departments to offer people who are eligible for social care a range of choices over how they receive their social care and support. So it applies to everyone. So that's it. It applies to anyone who presents themselves to those uh, local authorities. And self-directed support should and does allow people, their carers and families, to make informed choices on what their support looks like, how it's delivered, and making it possible for people to do different things to meet their agreed personal outcomes. Um, I remember talking to one person who I was working with when we were, we were working out a plan for how they were going to use their budget. And the thing he said to me was, um, it feels like the only limit is your imagination. Uh, I thought that was a great thing to say. I didn't want to contradict him and say, the only limit is your imagination as long as it agrees, meets your agreed personal outcomes. But I did think that was a good thing. Um, a good thing that somebody who's, who's presented themselves to a public body because they have some need for support thought, I'm here and the only limit is my imagination. There's now carers legis There's also now in Scotland carers legislation. Now what that means is that those people who are defined as having a caring responsibility are also able to access the options that are offered through self-directed support. Now, they would only do that if in their own right they had access to an additional budget. Um, but the carer's legislation also identifies that any carer has access to a carer's support plan to be able to sit down with someone and work out a plan of support that allows them to get the support that there's a carer need to sustain that caring role. So if you're eligible for funded support, there are, in Scotland there are what are described as four options. These are, the, these are Simon referenced them, the four options of self-directed support. Um, each of them is equally valid. Each of them is the right option for someone. People don't need to make a choice about the option and stick with it forever. Um, as long as people make informed choices about the four options, then each of those options is right for someone and for someone at, uh, at some and for people at different times in their lives. Um, the first option, so op what's called option one in our legislation, is that people are able to choose a direct payment. A direct payment simply is cash instead of service, services, money in lieu of services. You would need to set up a separate bank account. The money that you would have, would have been spent on you to access services comes to you as a cash payment, usually every four weeks, but there are all sorts of, particular, all sorts of other ways that it could happen. Usually every four weeks, usually to a separate bank account. Um, and you take that money and manage it yourself. Sometimes you would employ personal assistants, and uh, I know people have talked about personal assistants in Finland. Sometimes people would become an employer um, and, and take on the whole responsibility. Sometimes people would take that cash payment and say, I don't want to employ personal assistants, I want to have control over the cash, but I'm, I'm going to go out and buy support from an organisation. So you, you can do that, you can do that. You don't have to employ staff directly. Um, you can also take the cash and use it to buy support from an organisation um, or an agency. And there, there, there's quite a mix between what people do. Some people do, people do both of those things. You would also be able to access support. Wherever you live in Scotland, there are 32 local authorities, 32 public bodies. In each of those 32 public bodies um, who who, who are uh, charged with delivering the self-directed support policy and legislation, you would have access to an organisation or some organisations who would be able to provide information, advice and support around each of these options. 
The second option would be to say, I don't want to take the money as a cash payment, but I, I would like someone else to manage that money on my behalf, but I do really want to be involved in deciding how the money is used. Um, and that's, so the person directs their own support, but the money is held and managed by a third party. Um, often and most frequently that's, that's held and managed by a provider organization and the ideas of, a, of in, an individual service fund were developed around that. Sometimes the money is held by other organizations such as in Scotland we have centers for independent living, organizations who provide information, advice and support and they occasionally hold the money for people and the person would develop their plan, decide what they're going to use it for, and the organisation would manage it on their behalf. The options get all mixed up. Somebody I know gets the money as a direct payment. She has the direct payment. She then gives it to a, a, a third party, another organisation. Oh, she doesn't give all of it, actually. She gives most of it to this third party, and they manage it on her behalf. So the options themselves, it's really important that people know they have options, but the options themselves are merely something that helps to facilitate the idea of people having a good life. And actually, um, it's really important people know what their options are, but in the end, the most important thing is that people get the support that works for them. The third option is somebody says, I don't want to take a direct payment. I'm not sure about the idea of having the third party managing my money. Uh, I would just like you, social worker, at this current time to get the right support in for me. And lots of people, if you looked at the statistics, there are new, we were just talking yesterday and Simon will update this, that he was going to update the slide at some point in the near future. Um, the statistics for 16, 17, yeah, 16, 17 are out now. Um, I think that's right, yeah, I can never work back too many years, but I think the, the statistics are out. But they would still show that the greatest majority of people in the system of self-directed support in Scotland by far the greatest majority of people still access support through their, local, their social worker, their care manager, organizing and managing it on their behalf. And there are variations in different groups. For families with children, actually that's not the case. For older people, that's massively the case. So different, different people work differently with it. Self-directed support and the options are all available for everyone. Um, but people use them differently. Uh, and the fourth option is simply the, a mixture of the two. You might say, actually, that support that comes in that you've organized for me on a morning, every Friday, works really well. I'm happy that for that still to be organized, but I'd like to take the rest of it as a direct payment because me and my family want to work out a different way that we can all get a, an enjoyable break together. And that's what, that's what um, that would be, op what would be described in our legislation as option four, um, a mixture. Um, individual service fund, just specifically an individual service fund. Um, Centre for Welfare Reform, Citizen Network, In Control Scotland, all together published uh, some new guidance, a new guide, a new, a new booklet about individual service funds um, in the early part of this year. We were due to do it on the 28th of February and in Scotland, we had what was called the beast from the, I don't know whether it was Finn that sent it, but we had what was called the beast from the east came and the snow came down and nobody could move. Nobody could, <laughs> for about four days, nobody moved. So we had, to, we had to move our launch of the individual service fund paper. Uh, and an individual service fund, as I've said, is, is, a way that pe is, is a mechanism, a way that people use to manage the money inside an organization, a third party managing it on their behalf. And the four key factors of an individual service fund we've got up there, that idea up for an individual budget, you know your budget, that you can, that you can, the focus of your planning is on a good life, that your support is flexible and able to change, that you have maximum control or the right control for you, the maximum control that you want to have over the way that, that things uh, are organized and also that you have the right information so that you can make changes about that. Simon talked about a seven-step model. We also sometimes use that idea of a seven-step model. There have been various iterations. Um, it's just a way of thinking. So any model, a way of thinking about self-directed support, a way of 
helping people to think and plan through something that makes sense for them and that they can see can work. Um, various local authorities have adapted their own s steps, often, not seven. Um, and as Simon showed earlier, actually, sometimes you can boil it down to, I think, as you've done, you can boil it down to, th almost boil it down to three if you really, really want to boil it down. And I think sometimes it's good to do that. Um, in any model, in any, in any process, m things have a different importance. Um, and we would emphasize the importance of thinking and planning. The importance of being, having the opportunity to think what it is that you want to achieve. In Scotland, what, one of the things that is, uh, one of the terms that is very popular at the moment is something called good conversations. People being able to have a good conversation with whoever it is that they are thinking and planning around, around what it is that they want to achieve. Another set of ideas is something called what matters to me. That idea of focusing on what matters to the person, and that's your starting, what matters, what matters to me, what's important to me. Uh, and that being the starting point to the thinking and planning. Um, yesterday I was talking about a young woman who in, who in lots of ways is really, 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 really sorted in terms, of the, in terms of the support that she gets. She's a young woman with a physical disability and um, has organized, been able to organize her support in a way that works quite well for her. Um, and then she met some other people who helped her to think and plan around what her life might look like. And now she's going to do quite a few different things, including some things that are quite scary for her. She's going to do, she's actually going to go out for the first, or she actually has started going out for the first, she's, she's in her early 20s. She's actually started going out for the first time in her life without paid support. Um, she wants to do this. Her friends want to be able to offer her something when they go out with her. I, she said something like, I've given my friends the opportunity to help me when I'm out. It was quite scary. She'd never actually been out without paid support before. Um, but without having the chance to sit down with, with others and think and plan about what she wanted, she wouldn't have got there. Um, I think the first question, whenever people are thinking about developing a plan, is who do I want to help me to do this? Who do I want to help me to think and plan about what I want to achieve? What matters to me? Who is it that I want to have that good conversation with? And it could be your family could be a family in existing support arrangements, could be a social worker, could be all of those people together. Um, how is it really going? How is it really going with time? I will just check. No idea because, uh, oh, yeah, we're, we're okay. Well, yeah, good, good. Um, so how is it really going? So in, in, in Scotland, we have something called Audit Scotland, uh, which is a public body that looks at a whole range of, 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 uh, whole range of ways that, that public services work. They did, af after the implementation in 2014, they did a survey of how's it going in the first year. And in the autumn of 2017, so three and a bit years after implementation, <laughs> they did a further review of how's it going. So they looked, essentially, they looked at six in detail, looked at six of the 32 local authorities, so six of the public bodies. They met with uh, groups of people who had experience of self-directed support, um, they met with people, we, we set up a focus group of people who'd been through what's called the Partners in Policy Making Programme, which is a, a family leadership programme that we're involved in. Um, and these were the two key findings from their, from their report. They said there were many examples of positive progress in, in implementing self-directed support, but no, but, but no evidence of the transformation. So the cultural, the psychological, the transformation that's required for self-directed support to really work for everyone. Why is it so hard? It, it <laughs> hadn't, they'd found no evidence of that. They found examples of people being supported in new and different ways, but not everyone getting the choice and control that was envisaged in the strategy, in the policy, in the legislation, and in the work that, that lots of people have been going towards. So still lots, lots, to, lots that's been done, 
but still lots, lots, lots more to do. We talk about trying to further unlock the potential of self-directed sport in Scotland. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So what works for people? So just a couple of slides about what works for people. Um, simple and easy to understand processes, whether that is the assessment process, whether that's the process for deciding what's the level of budget that you're likely to get, the indication of the level of funding that you're likely to get, um, or even the fact that you actually get information about that. Um, simple and easy to understand processes are really important, not only for individuals and families, but also for workers as well, of course. Maximum flexibility in using the resources to achieve plans. Simon said uh, about the experience of of um, choice and flexibility being reined in when people actually say, oh, I'd like to do this. You actually really, really, that we, would, we would say, without maximum flexibility, self-directed sport won't work. In fact, it's even more important as there's, in Scotland, there's much less money around than there used to be. As less money's available, it's even more important that that emphasis on maximum flexibility in using resources to achieve plans is not only allowed, but promoted, but encouraged. The message shouldn't be, it's okay. The message should be, yes, you can. However, most people who are planning a budget and doing something different ask one question. The question they ask is, can I really spend my money on that? So you need people who are out there saying, Yes, you can. That's a good way for you to achieve your goal. You need good accessible information. So you need information in different formats, whether it's a film, whether it's a leaflet, whatever it is, that's accessible to everyone so that they can understand the choice. You can only make choices if you, ha if you know the choices that you're able to make them from. You can only spend your money on different things if you know the possibility to do that is there. That's why peer support is so important. That's why good stories are so important. That's why people themselves making connections with other people is so important, um, which is what I've said before. You need to invest in individuals and families as partners. One of the most powerful things that I've been involved in, in the last three years is the Partners in Policy Making program, which is a formal program of, of training and leadership for parents of disabled children and individual self-advocates. 40 of whom come together over eight weekends. They hear about self-directed support. They hear about inclusion. They hear about, um, they hear about making change happen and education and work. They hear about from people from all around Scotland, from all around the UK, and sometimes from people from further afield. But crucially, what they do is make connections with other people who can help them think and plan. They have new pos They go away with new possibilities. Um, you also need what, what works is good support in thinking and planning, that good conversation, that access to a range of different people who might do that. You might do that. You might do that with somebody else. You might just do that with somebody else who's got a good plan that you know locally. Um, but you also need good support with the practical arrangements. So if you are choosing to take a direct payment and become an employer, you need to know there's some way where you can go for advice about what about tax, what about pension, what about national insurance, all the things that, in, that you need to have. Um, and what works for people is actually public bodies really believing that people are experts in their own lives because that's the way that power shifts. Power, and, power shifts and change happens. What works for organisations? Really easy thing to say, really difficult thing to do. Fostering a culture that supports innovation, change and sharing. Um, and developing leaders, leadership, and followership at all levels. Now, what that means is that people at different levels in an organization can, can be leaders in making self-directed support work. And people at different levels in organizations need to be followers of those leaders at those different levels. We need to have leaders at, at, at all levels in all organizations, um, those champions who can make it work not based on formal job title, but based on skill, based on interest, based on influence, based on the way that they can actually help people to get the right support. We need to focus on 
values and, and a belief that positive changes happen. Sometimes it feels like all the focus, and I'm actually, <laughs> what I'm doing is doing, the, I'm doing a triangle, right? <laughs> doing a triangle and I'm saying sometimes it feels like all the focus is on the technical bits, getting this, the internal systems right, which should only be like the top bit of the triangle. And the main part, you know the triangle I'm talking about. <laughs> There's a quite a nice graphic of a triangle. The main part should be focusing on the values and beliefs and the practice and getting those bits right, which should form much more of the base of that, the base and the body of that triangle. You need a clear enabling message. When I worked in one, when I was helping one local authority to implement self-directed support, uh, the clear enabling message, the clear enabling message was we can do different things differently than we've already done before. So when I was working alongside social workers. And they were saying, that's not what we do around here. I was able to say, that's not what you've done, but that's what you are able to do now. But the message was there from within that structure. And we need to develop good stories. We need to develop, we need to believe in the knowledge and competence of frontline staff. I'm just going to go quickly. Um, and these are key features. This is, this, is, this is another boiled down version, the three key features, knowing knowing your Id of, of any personalized systems at work, an identified upfront allocation of resources available at the start of the process. That doesn't just mean money. It means the resources. It means all the things. But it, it does specifically include money. A support system that facilitates choice, control, and flexibility. So a support system, that means the people who can be with you to give you the information, to help you think, to help you to think beyond what you know so far, to help you believe that what is there is not only what's possible. And a focus on outcomes and a change in culture and shift of power. So focus on what it is we want to achieve. So that's the starting point. What is it you want to achieve? What have you got to achieve it? What support can you get to help you achieve it? And to plan to achieve it. Um, I'm just... Mm. Some really simple stories, are just, uh, just a couple of really simple examples that, that, uh, that describe that then, by the idea of focusing on what you want to achieve and thinking about, thinking about self-directed sport being for everyone. Mary's story is about an older woman who's actually in her 90s, who lived at home, but who's becoming increasingly frail. Lots of support from her, from her family, Lots of support from her grandchildren, actually. Lots and lots of support from her grandchildren and their partners. They're becoming increasingly worried about their grandmother and, and parent as well, because the parents were still around, um, because she was more frail and needed more support at home. Um, she accessed a budget from that local... Th what the outcome that they wanted to achieve and she wanted to have was to be able to stay in her own home. They accessed a budget from their local authority and used the funding to pay for someone to stay in their grandparents' house, but not all the time, every other week. Every other week, somebody stayed there, 24 hours a day. The other week, the family still provided all the support. They used the available resources that they had to achieve the outcome for their grandma to be able to stay in her own home and to get some different support to be able to do some of the things that she liked, which was getting out in the garden and doing baking. Second story is Stephen. Stephen was a man with uh, multiple sclerosis, is a man with multiple sclerosis, who had got in touch with his local authority because he got in touch with his local authority because he wanted his wife to get a break. He, he got in touch because he wanted his wife to get a break from having to, what he thought was the burden of having to care for him all the time. Um, he was able to work with a local provider. He didn't, he didn't choose to take the money as a direct payment. He chose to work with a local provider um, who managed the money on his behalf. And when they talked to him, they found out that what he really had used to like to do, he, he used to like to be around boats. Um, and they were able to find somebody who could work with him who helped, to, who helped him to do the things that he liked. Simple as that. Helped him to go out. That's, self, that's what self-directed support is. Helped him to go out and to get back and to do things around boats and sometimes to go on boats. What he wanted was for his wife to get a break. What happened was he got out on boats and his wife got a break as well. Um, third story is, an, is quite an old story, um, but I 
I put it there because actually there's a little bit of a Finnish connection here. <laughs> um, so this was a young man, a young man with uh, a young man at home with his with his mum and dad, and they were looking for sport both to think about how how um, he could keep connected with other young people, but also they were looking for sport to think about how do we all get a break again. So it was one of those situations. Thinking about, those were the two things that they wanted. Um, they sat down, developed a plan together. Everybody sat in the room, not always at the same time, but people came in and out of the room, sat down, developed a plan. The plan was um, to, uh, to, um, to both uh, employ some personal assistance, it was a very small budget, employ some personal assistance occasionally to help him to make, keep connected locally, but also to think about how he, could, um, how he could get back in touch with his sister who no longer lived at home. And what happened was they paid a family friend from their budget to take him to New Zealand. So they paid the family friend's airfare from the budget. He went to New Zealand. He stayed with his sister for three weeks. He had a fantastic holiday. The family all got a break. It cost less than it would have cost at the local service that would have provided a break there. He also then developed his plan in all sorts of other ways. And the reason why I've kept it there is because one of the things he did was he came to Finland with his personal assistant and got involved in the young people. I, I've got some pictures of him camping out, or not actually camping, but out in the woods and lakes of Finland. Um, so, remembering a quote. So, what, anybody, any thoughts? Who might have said that? Who might have said that quote? Petri, who do you think? <laughs> me, well, I could have said that quote, yes. But it is it isn't it isn't me. It's it's a it's a group of it's a group of people from the Partners in Policy Making programme when they were doing a presentation at the end. At the end of the programme, and this is one of the things that they wanted to present back to local to politicians. They wanted to present that back the fact that self directed support has great potential and it can make massive changes for people in their, in their own lives. But it is still, there's still, there's still, still, still lots to do. And the most important changes are changes in practice. And I think that is the end of the slideshow. So that you actually know what I'm commenting, I'll, I'll do it in English. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. There are a lot of issues to be learned from there, but I picked up the, sort of the three most important or four most important to me. Firstly, do not create uh, a service ghettos that are costly and uh, not actually fitting the purpose. Believe that uh, people are the best, uh, best experts of their own lives. Create a community-based uh, uh, services, and I'm just referring to these kind of uh, examples that make it concrete how you can do and what you can uh, do. And so this is something I hope that we can carry here in, uh, in Finland. And the fourth is actually, and the most uh, empowering message is, this is doable and it is done already. Ah, so I think it was very good sum up, thank you. And I will, you will still have a chance to talk after lunch and everybody please now think about your questions. Now we should go for lunch, better it's just outside the door, isn't it, yeah. Thanks.